Hello everyone, I'm Chris from Geeky Medics, and today I'm going to cover how to take a comprehensive respiratory history. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to be the first to know about our latest videos. This video is structured around taking a medical history. Let's start off by looking at how to open a consultation. To begin any consultation, you need to wash your hands, don any required personal protective equipment, and introduce yourself to the patient, including your name and role. You should then confirm the patient's details, including their name and date of birth. Then go on to explain the reason for the consultation to the patient. Finally, you should gain consent to proceed with taking a history. OK, let's move on to the presenting complaint. In this part of the history taking process, the patient should be asked some open questions and then allowed to speak freely about their issues without early interruption. Some examples of open questions you could use include What's brought you into the hospital today? Or more simply, How can I help? You can also facilitate the patient to expand on their presenting complaint further if required with some additional phrases such as Can you tell me more about that? When the patient has finished speaking, it is helpful to check if they have any other presenting complaints. If there are multiple presenting complaints, you should work with the patient to establish a shared agenda for the rest of the consultation. In the context of taking a respiratory history, you may find that patients present with multiple respiratory symptoms. For example, they may have breathlessness and a cough. So let's now look at some of the key respiratory symptoms you may come across. Top of the list is dyspnea, or breathlessness. Other common symptoms include cough, which may be associated with hemoptysis, or coughing up blood, wheeze, chest pain, or systemic symptoms such as a fever. We're going to discuss these symptoms in a little more detail shortly, but first let's take a look at the Socrates acronym. This acronym is a useful tool for exploring each of the patient's presenting symptoms in a bit more detail. It was originally designed to explore pain, but it can be applied to most other symptoms. However, it's worth bearing in mind that some of the elements of Socrates may not be relevant to all symptoms. The first part of the Socrates framework involves establishing the site of the symptom. For example, in a patient presenting with pain, we would want to ask about the location of the pain. We then move on and ask questions about the symptom's onset. For example, in a patient presenting with breathlessness, we might want to clarify whether the breathlessness came on suddenly or more gradually. It's then important to ask some specific questions to establish the characteristics of the symptom. For example, we could ask patients with breathlessness to describe how it feels. Is it constant or does it come and go? Radiation involves asking if the symptom moves anywhere else. This is most commonly applied to patients presenting with pain. For example, if they have chest pain, does this spread to any other part of the body? We then move on and explore whether there are any other symptoms which are associated with the primary symptom. The patient may not have mentioned these earlier in open questioning, so it may be important to ask them about some specific symptoms. For example, if they are presenting with breathlessness, we might want to ask them directly whether they are experiencing any chest pain. Time course refers to how the symptom has changed over time. So it's important to build up a picture of how the symptom has changed since its onset. For example, we might want to ask, how has the shortness of breath changed over time? Exacerbating or relieving factors involves asking the patient if anything makes the symptom worse or better. This is quite important in the context of a respiratory history because patients may present with respiratory symptoms which are worsened by certain situations. For example, a patient with asthma may have symptoms which are worsened by their occupation or being in a work environment. Finally, severity involves asking the patient to assess the severity of the symptom by getting them to grade it on a scale of 0 to 10. This is most commonly used when asking patients about their pain but it can be applied to other symptoms too. Let's look at our first key respiratory symptom, dyspnea. This means shortness of breath or breathlessness, and this is a very common symptom of respiratory disease. 
It's important to explore the onset, time course, and any exacerbating and relieving factors. One of the ways we can assess the severity of dyspnea is by using the Medical Research Council Dyspnea Scale. This scale assesses the functional limitation of the patient due to their dyspnea. There are five grades, and this ranges from being breathless during strenuous exercise only, which is grade one and mild, to grade five, where the patient is too breathless to leave the house, or breathless even when dressing. Our next key respiratory symptom is cough. Cough can be categorised into acute, subacute and chronic. And this relates back to asking the patient about the onset and the time course of their symptom. So an acute cough is one which is present for less than three weeks. A subacute cough is one which has been present for between three and eight weeks. And a chronic cough is one which is persistent for more than eight weeks. It's important in your respiratory history to ask the patient directly about hemoptysis. Hemoptysis means coughing up blood, and this is a red flag symptom for more serious pathology such as lung cancer. Our next key symptom is wheeze. A wheeze is a coarse, continuous whistling sound produced in the respiratory airways during breathing. It's associated with airway narrowing and obstruction, so diseases such as asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and anaphylaxis, which cause airway narrowing and obstruction, can cause wheeze. Wheeze may be audible without a stethoscope and may be reported by the patient or their carer. Chest pain is another key symptom to cover in a respiratory history. We can use the Socrates framework discussed earlier in order to explore the chest pain in more detail. Patients with respiratory disease, such as a pulmonary embolism, or inflammation of the pleural lining, such as pleurisy following a chest infection, may present with pleuritic chest pain. This is often described as being really sharp and worsened by breathing and coughing. It's also worth remembering that cardiovascular conditions, for example, a patient having um, an acute coronary syndrome or myocardial infarction, can present with respiratory symptoms for example, they may present with chest pain and breathlessness. Our last set of symptoms are systemic symptoms. These include things such as fatigue, fever, night sweats and weight loss. The presence of these symptoms is suggestive of a more serious underlying disease process. For example, an underlying cancer causing fatigue and weight loss. The last step is to think about performing a systems review also called a systemic inquiry. This involves asking the patient about symptoms in other body systems, which may or may not be relevant to the primary presenting complaint. A systemic inquiry may also identify symptoms that the patient has forgotten to mention earlier on in the history taking. Some common symptoms which you should ask about are displayed on this slide. We're now going to talk about establishing the patient's ideas, concerns and expectations often referred to as ICE. This helps us gain an insight into how the patient currently perceives their situation, what they are worried about, and what they hope to gain from the consultation. Ideally, the exploration of ideas, concerns and expectations should be fluid throughout the consultation in response to patient cues. This will help ensure your history taking is more natural, patient-centred and not overly formulaic. It can be challenging to use the ICE structure in a way which sounds natural. However, this will improve as you practice and build upon your history taking skills. There are some examples here of how you can establish the patient's ideas, concerns and expectations. Regarding ideas, it can be useful to ask the patient, what do you think the problem is? Or, what are your thoughts about what is happening? When exploring concerns, you can ask a question such as, is there anything that's worrying you? And when you're exploring expectations, you can ask a question such as, what were you hoping I'd be able to do for you today? Regarding expectations, patients may have specific expectations from the consultation. For example, this may be related to a particular blood test or a scan or referral. It's really important to identify these expectations early on in your history taking. This will help you address them later on in your consultation. Let's now think about the past medical history. 
This involves asking the patient if they have any known medical conditions. If the patient does have a medical condition, it's useful to gather more details to assess how well controlled the disease is. This is especially important when it comes to long-term conditions, such as asthma and COPD. It can also be useful to identify which treatments the patient is receiving, and whether they've had any hospital admissions as a result of their condition. You should also ask if the patient has previously undergone any surgery or procedures. Some patients may have limited knowledge of their medical conditions. In that situation, it can be useful to ask, are there any problems for which you're taking medication for? This may open up your past medical history questions. These are some relevant conditions you may identify in your respiratory history. Many of these conditions are long-term conditions and patients may be undergoing active treatment and present with symptoms related to these conditions. For example, a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease may present with an exacerbation of their disease, or a patient with asthma may present with a worsening of asthma symptoms or an asthma attack. There are increasing levels of multimorbidity, which is the presence of several long-term conditions. So you may find in your respiratory history that a patient has several of these conditions. For example, they may have COPD, which has then led to the development of heart failure, and they then go on and suffer a pulmonary embolism. When considering drug history, you should ask if the patient is taking any prescribed or over-the-counter medicines. If the patient is taking a medicine, you should find out about the dose, frequency, form and route. It's also worth asking about whether the patient is experiencing any side effects from their medication. Some medications can cause respiratory side effects. For example, a dry cough is a very common side effect of a class of drugs called ACE inhibitors, which are used in the management of high blood pressure. You should also ask if the patient has any allergies, and if so, clarify what type of reaction they had to the substance. It's important here to distinguish the patient who had a mild rash versus a patient who had a full-blown anaphylaxis reaction following administration of a medication. These are the broad categories of medication you may come across in a drug history which are relevant to respiratory disease. Probably the biggest category are the inhalers. Inhalers are used in the management of a wide range of respiratory disease, but most commonly asthma and COPD. Inhalers fall into different categories depending on their mode of action. For example, beta-2 agonists and muscarinic antagonists are used to open up the small airways in the lungs. Inhaled corticosteroids are used to reduce inflammation in the lungs and avoid some of the systemic side effects of oral steroids. Patients who are having exacerbations of disease may be placed on a course of oral steroids. Various other drugs you may come across include the mucolytics, such as carbocysteine, and these are used in patients with excessive secretions. Leukotriene receptor antagonists are used in the management of chronic asthma. Theophylline is a less commonly used drug in the treatment of asthma. One important fact about theophylline is that it should be prescribed by brand name. Finally, patients with respiratory disease may be taking antibiotics, These may be prescribed in the acute setting, for example, the management of an infective exacerbation of COPD, or some patients with chronic respiratory disease may take long-term antibiotics to prevent infection. In your family history, you should ask the patient whether they've had any first-degree relatives with respiratory disease. You want to find out about the age at which the disease developed and the cause of death, if applicable. There are some respiratory conditions, such as cystic fibrosis, which are inherited diseases. For example, cystic fibrosis is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner, and a family history is really important here. Moving on to social history, it's important to explore the patient's social history to both understand their social context and identify any potential respiratory risk factors. You should ask questions about the patient's general social context including, for example, the type of accommodation they live in. Who lives with the patient? What's their personal support network? You should find out a bit about their activities of daily living, 
and what tasks they're able to carry out independently and what tasks they require assistance with. It's also important to establish whether they have any carer input. Smoking is a significant risk factor for many respiratory diseases, including chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and lung cancer. You should record the patient's smoking history, including the type and amount of tobacco used. This can be quantified in terms of pack years. One pack is 20 cigarettes. And to calculate pack years, you multiply the number of years smoked by the average number of packs smoked per day. There are some other aspects of the social history which are particularly important in the context of taking a respiratory history. For example, it's important to establish the patient's current and previous occupations. This helps identify any potential exposure to agents which may lead to respiratory disease. For example, certain occupations, such as people working in shipyards, construction and plumbing, before new regulations were implemented, may have been exposed to asbestos, which increases their risk of mesothelioma. Another example are farmers, who may be at risk of developing allergic extrinsic alveolitis. It's also important to ask about pets and hobbies. Allergies to pets are common and may not be immediately obvious in the history. For example, a patient with asthma may find that they're wheezy when they're at home, but not when they're outside of the house, and the trigger here may be the family pet. Other aspects of the social history involve asking about alcohol, recreational drug use, gambling and exercise. If relevant, you should also take a brief travel history. This is especially important if the patient's symptoms are suggestive of an infective etiology, particularly tuberculosis. Long-haul travel, such as taking a long-haul flight, may be relevant as this can be a risk factor for venous thromboembolism. Finally, you need to bring your consultation to a close. You should summarise the key points back to the patient and ask them if they have any questions or concerns that have not been addressed. You should thank the patient for their time, wash your hands and dispose of any personal protective equipment. OK, so that's everything for today. Thank you for watching our guide to taking a respiratory history. If you have any suggestions for improvements or future topics to cover, make sure to let us know in the comments. If you haven't already, please subscribe to be the first to know when we release new videos.